tell me when you're when you're gonna record. We've always been the church, so I feel like I've always loved Jesus. I was seven when I asked my parents if I could be baptized. I knew I was committing my life to Jesus. Now that I'm older, I understand that's more than just a one-time thing. It's a lifelong commitment to serve God and be a part of His family. Being part of a spiritual family involves serving the Lord through His church, and I enjoy serving as one of the greeters at Vintage. I love all the people there, and I love worship and all the messages that Pastor Keegan shares. So the biggest challenge as I've been here at Vintage Church as a Christian, I would say would be not reading the Word of God and not applying it to your life. When I don't do that, it starts to mess with everything around you, like your attitude, how you act towards people. It, you start to, like I mean, I feel angry sometimes, so I kind of lash out some, like quite frequently. Being part of Vintage Church has helped me to grow as a Christian and understand God's Word more. It's not just reciting Romans 10, 9 and being done. You have to commit to pursuing God your entire life. Whenever I make a mistake or sense something I shouldn't, I know I can pray to God and He forgives me and brings me peace. Well, come on, church. Let's give it up for Josh. Wasn't that awesome? Man. Joshua is a great young man. You know, it's interesting. A lot of times at church, we talk about the crazy prodigal stories. But can I just tell you, as a parent of four children myself, my responsibility as a parent, as their papa is what they call me, is to make sure that we train them up in the way they should go. So that when they get to Joshua's age and they realize that following Jesus is so much more, they have a foundation to build on. Can I just tell you, that's the greater miracle than the prodigal is the one that's raised up in the house of God and grows as a result of being poured into by uh, godly parents. And so I, thank you so much. I say all that to say that's the reason why we started a school. It's the reason why we take children's ministry so seriously. These foundational moments. It's interesting. People will go into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt in you know, woke universities, but they won't invest anything in the most formative time of a kid's life. And so I want to encourage you. Maybe you're in here and you're looking around going, man, I don't, I don't know what all they're teaching me. I don't, I'm teaching my kids. I'm, I don't know if I feel more comfortable with that. Here's what I would say to you. Where there is a will, your will, because it's your responsibility as a parent, there is a way. Believe. Ask God about the things you can do to pour into your kids. Do you care more about them going to Harvard or heaven? Look at what you do, because that's actually what you believe, okay? I'm just, just putting it out there. Anyways, for those of you who are new, uh, welcome. <laughs> My name's Stephen, and I'm the pastor here, and we are continuing our series through Nehemiah. The, sub the subline is a time to build. How many of you guys were um, at the church yesterday where it was a time to destroy? Anybody here for that? Come on. It was awesome. I think we have some footage of that old ugly building. It's amazing. You go in, and you destroy, and it gets nicer. Can we, can we play some of that? I think we got it. Yeah. They were just tearing down that eyesore. We're now evaluating. We've got um, engineers and architects hired. They're evaluating to see if we can salvage any of it. Uh, on, on the chance that we can't, we're going to tear that whole sucker down and build something nice. Come on. It's going to be really, really great. I'm going to tell you more about that. Uh, in, actually, next week, I'll be giving you an update on that project, what we're going to use this building for. It's absolutely needed uh, to go to the next place that we're going. I do also want to update you. I finally got into a piece of heavy machinery. This is me. You can tell I'm getting used to it. They didn't completely trust me, so my five-year-old was in there just making sure everything was working right and going good. I finally got into the dozer, super excited about that. All right, you can turn that off now. You can turn that off now, okay? Jake, the owner of that piece of equipment, is a much better operator than I was. You know, before we jump into week two, we're going to talk about the burden that God gave Nehemiah. Last week, we built a massive foundation uh, on the background of Nehemiah. I do want to make a couple uh, corrections to my message last week. I covered 1,600 years in about 38 minutes, and so I made a couple mistakes. The first one was uh, Mount Moriah and Mount Sinai are not the same mountain. It was Mount Moriah where Isaac was offered by Abraham that was, is also thought to be the place where God offered up Jesus on the cross. That's Mount Moriah, not Mount Sinai. And uh, for whatever reason, I misspoke and said that Jacob, that, uh, that Jacob was, um, uh, was Isaac's 
brother. It wasn't, it was his son, okay? Joseph was Jacob's son. So I just want to correct that. Hey, you know what, pastors make mistakes. I think we should just, for the record, up front, let you know I missed a couple of those there. Uh, Before we jump in and we talk about the burden we continue to build on last week, I do want to draw your attention to something that we do every single month. It is one of the most important things to do as a church. It's called Membership University. Here's what Membership University is all about. God has so much more than you, for you than you just coming in and hearing a good message and feeling happy only to get slapped by life on Monday. Come on, somebody. All right? He wants you to actually be a part of what God's building. Here's what I, I say this every time, and it seems a little harsh, but it, it is harsh, but it's really, really good for you. Here's what it is, okay? If you've been coming for a few weeks, this is the place you're going to learn about God. You're going to lean in. You wanna, you're, you're starting to think, man, I really like this. You know, I, I, I want to go further. You've been, you need to come to this, okay? If you've been coming here for several weeks and you're still not sure, you should go find another church where you can be sure and you can be plugged in. That is very, very important. The longer you sit in the seat, consuming, 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 what happens if all we did was eat all day long every day? Physically, we would be huge. Guess what? Many of us are huge spiritually and not in a good way. Okay, diet, right? Serving is to diet what exercise is. Okay, you've got to exercise your faith. We teach you how to do that. We actually give you an on-ramp on what it means to be a member and to serve others and to contribute. So I want to encourage you to come. It's today after the last service at 1 p.m. Uh, Child care, food, everything is provided. There's no excuses. We already have over 100 adults, so you will not be alone. I would love to share with you uh, what makes this place so special. And no, it is not just one person. It is a family of believers committed to a strategy of ministry. So I want to encourage you to do that. The big idea for Nehemiah, remember, Nehemiah is not a priest. He's a normal guy. Why would I say that? Because when you read the Bible, it's tempting to read about these great men and women of God and to think that they were the ones that were great and to overlook God. The reality is the scripture is the story of everyday normal people who put God first. and As a result, he shows up big in their life. If there's any area of your life that's hurting, if there's any area of your life that's not good right now, it's not God's fault, it's yours. He's put everything into your hand. It's called his word. He's put his Holy Spirit into those who believe and confess him as Lord and Savior. You can push forward. You can grow. Remember, God doesn't choose the, mo- the most qualified person to work through. Usually, they're also the most full of pride. Has anybody uh, bumped into an expert lately? Full of pride, know-it-alls. What he does is he uses humble, ordinary people who say, you know what, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. And that's really what this series is about. As we talk about a time to build, I don't believe it's just building the stuff we're building. I believe it's building your life. It's building your family. It's building your faith. We see this in Matthew 6, 33. Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God above all. Everyone say all. All in the original language still means all. All. Seek God first in everything you do. Look what he says. And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. That is not just the story of Nehemiah. That is also the story of us every single day, every day as we follow Christ. What I want to do is I want to give a little bit of a background to where, we, where Nehemiah finds himself. I gave you the 50,000-foot view last week. I went all the way back to Genesis and I talked really fast. So some of you, you had to like download the podcast or the YouTube and slow me down halfway. You definitely can't listen to me on double speed. But I want to make sure that I give you an understanding because you've got to know that things that you happen in your life and things that you see that happened in the Bible, they never happen in a vacuum. It never just happens all at once. It's usually, almost all the time, the result of steps that we take. Many, many steps led to Nehemiah being in this place of exile. And I want to talk just a little bit about that background. First, we need to know Nehemiah's background. I want to remind you that Nehemiah was living in a foreign country as a slave in exile in the Persian Empire. Uh, He was actually likely born there. He would have likely been a part of the second generation born into slavery. He served as the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, a high and trusted position in the Persian court. He grew up, put God first, and God put him next to the most powerful man in the, the ancient world at the time. Nehemiah was a layperson. He wasn't a priest or a prophet, yet he was deeply spiritual and devoted to God. We're going to learn about two other characters that were more political building characters and then more priestly characters later. Okay, there was a partnership there. Okay, some historical context. I want to talk about the fall of the southern kingdom. Okay, that's the, the kingdom was divided after Solomon because Solomon did not follow God. 
did not trust God the way he should have. He allowed all kinds of demonic occult practices back into the nation. And as a result, although the nation was united under Saul, David, and Solomon, after Solomon, it split into the northern and southern kingdoms. Okay, the exile that we're talking about in the book of Nehemiah is the fall of the southern empire. The Babylonian empire led by King Nebuchadnezzar. You know King Neb? King Neb? Okay, yep, yep. King Neb, he invaded Judah. In 586 BCE, Jerusalem was conquered and the temple was completely destroyed. Many Jews were taken into exile. There were actually three exiles, three groups. They always took the best and the brightest. And they would re-educate them. Does that sound familiar? Reprogram the deplorables to be like the empire. That's what they would do. This is like an, an ancient strategy. So they took the best and the brightest, the future leaders, and moved them to Babylon. But not all of those leaders abandoned Yahweh, abandoned God. Not all of those families went with the script. Then we see a transition of power while they're in exile from one kingdom to another. Can I just tell you, kingdoms come and go. But when you follow God, you can thrive no matter what is happening around you. They come and go. There's a transition of power from Babylon to Persia. The Babylonian Empire fell to the Persians, led by King Cyrus in 539 BCE. King Cyrus allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. It was a, degree, a decree he made 538 years before Christ. This was a monumental decree. Christ the Messiah had to come through the line of David, through the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. 700 prophecies about the coming Christ. It required a Jerusalem rebuilt. This is the first decree saying, hey, we're going to come back and set up what we're going to talk about in December, Advent, the coming of Christ. But I want to talk just a moment about King Cyrus specifically, because I think there's some things that can help us as believers living in Babylon. Does anybody feel like we're Christians living in Babylon? Yeah, yeah. Well, by the way, we always have been. It's, listen, Christians throughout, the hist throughout history have always been countercultural. I want to explain something about a historical figure that might help you Right? Thrive where you are and see the way God sees. King Cyrus, God's unexpected instrument. This is a pagan king. I'm going to make a few, a few points. He was not a Jew. He did not grow up hearing the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He did not, he did not listen to or watch Nehemiah week one. Okay? He, he, he didn't. But he did see patterns among the remnant, which we talked about last week, that stood out to him. He saw patterns, and even as a pagan king, he realized real quick that Yahweh, the God of the Bible, was not a God to be trifled with. He started to see patterns. He didn't worship Yahweh, the God of Israel, but he certainly feared him. And that's important. Did you know that knowing God and loving God, what comes before all of those things is fearing God? Maybe you're in here today, and you're just like, oh, there is no God. What an arrogant thing to say. It takes more pride to believe that there is no God, to be an atheist, than it does to be one. You've decided in your heart that since the foundation of the world, in your little existence, your life, your, your spot in humanity, that you know more than all the people who came before you. You're educated. You're smart. Did you know that we're in one of the most materially rich centuries ever? It's also been the deadliest. Hundreds of millions of people have been slaughtered by the experts, by the class that says, I'm going to worship my head and not my God first. You see, faith and reason go together. It does. You know, faith humbles reason. It reminds reasonable people that are tempted to worship themselves that they are not God. Right? Reason also gives a seatbelt to faith. You know what I'm talking about. Put the snake down, snake handler. Come on. Let's start being reasonable. Do you know God's a God of reason? One of his names is, om is omniscient. It means all science, all knowledge. It's literally where the scientific revolution got its start was men and women of God who looked at this ordered universe and thought to themselves, I can understand this place because I was created by God. What happens when we throw that to the wind? Well, now men can become women, apparently. They can give birth and even breastfeed. It's ridiculous. I know some of you are like, he's getting political. Really? Like, I don't think that's political. I, I think that's common sense. That's not true. Don't believe your lying eyes, by the way. I don't know, tangent. How God used Cyrus, a few things that God did in using this pagan king. In his sovereign wisdom, God chose Cyrus, a pagan king, to play a pivotal role in the restoration of Jerusalem and the return, or rather, the, the coming of the Messiah. How God uses Cyrus. First, he issued a decree to rebuild the temple. Cyrus was the one that made the proclamation that the Jews could return from all of the providences of Babylon back to their homeland. Then he acknowledged Yahweh, the God of 
the Bible. In this proclamation, Cyrus recognized the God of Israel, stating that it was God who had given him the kingdoms of the earth and appointed him to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. It's incredible. Fear always starts. When you fear God, then you can know him because you'll pause and you'll actually take the Bible seriously. Then you'll put into practice what you learn in the Bible, and guess what? You'll learn to love God. You can't help but love him when you look back and you look at all the steps he told you to take, and he never told you to step on sand. He always gave you one rock, one sure step at a time. Cyrus was at the beginning of that, but he by in, in no ways worshipped the God of Israel yet. He also returned stolen temple proper, pro, property. Not only did Cyrus allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem, but he made restitution of what was stolen, those sacred instruments from the temple. This is interesting, too, because we have lots of people that come to Christ, right? And, and this, this is a big deal. Lots of people will say things when you stand up against culture, or you, you challenge wickedness in the world. And they'll say things, Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners, do you really think that was the context of their relationship? You might know every single one of them repented and they made restitution. A tax collector actually not only paid back what was stolen, but even more. You know what happens when you encounter Christ? You change. You repent. All that word means is to change direction, to go another way. Next, he guaranteed safe passage. It was a very dangerous world in the ancient world. Under his degree, the Jews were not only given safe passage, but they were war- everyone around them were warned, don't you mess with them. They have my permission, my seal. He covered these people going back to their homeland. Next, he promoted religious freedom. Yes, that's a biblical idea, not an American idea. He promoted religious freedom. Islam means to submit. That's not what Israel means. You know what Israel means? To wrestle. You know, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to wrestle with God. Jacob, his name would be changed to Israel. I think I got that right. I don't think I'll have to make that correction next week. He wrestled with God through the night. Many are like, what is that about? Jacob had some issues in his heart. He was a third generation. He saw this faith. Abraham walked with God, knew God. Isaac knew about God, put it in him. The man Jacob didn't really walk with God until that night. His brother Esau is ready to get back at him for something evil he did. And he cries out to God, and he wrestles with God all the night. He refuses to let God go. Finally, God dislocates his hip. What is that about? When you wrestle with God, don't expect God to change. You change. This book is not about you. It's about God. It changes you. It reads you as you read it. He would walk for the rest of his life. Jacob would be called Israel, which means to wrestle with God. Here's the problem with, here's the problem with doubt. Doubt that's not dealt with and not brought to in humility, the word of God becomes unbelief. And the Bible says God can do no great thing where there's unbelief in the room. Many of you, your life is full of unbelief. It's because you haven't dealt with the doubt. You haven't asked the questions that you needed to ask. You haven't actually, in a humble way, sought to understand. Instead, you want everyone to understand you and your lived experience. Is everyone okay in 830? I'm a little feisty. But it matters. It matters that we take God seriously. That's where the blessing is. That's what Nehemiah understood. This is how God was using this pagan king because God's people forgot that. Forgot that. He promoted religious freedom. There was tolerance demanded in the Persian Empire. Granted, today, in ancient Persia, the tolerance is gone, but it was there. Next, he acknowledged Jewish leaders. He would send back Zerubbabel. He would actually allow them to self-govern, to set up some things, to set up some foundations. Zerubbabel would lay the foundation of the temple. He was more of a civic leader. Another word for a political leader. He began to bring order into the region. Ezra would follow him. He was the priest, the pastor. He would begin to set up the temple. But then the whole city didn't have any walls to protect it. That was Nehemiah. Do you know what the job of the layperson is in the church? To stand at the gates and to protect the church. You have to protect your right to worship God because if you don't, people will raid, come in, and steal it. This is a picture of religious freedom here. It's a picture. When we don't protect it, when we think that our, only, our faith belongs in the doors and that's it, when we think that our faith is only personal and private, okay, what happens is evil men and women will come in and steal it from us. Amen. It's what will happen. It's, a, it's something repeated in history over and over and over and over again. Next, he was the fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, biblical prophecy. God can use pagan people. Wake up, wake up. I like that. I got real roosters at my house, but anyways. He was the fulfillment of prophecy. 
Cyrus's action fulfilled the prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah. Isaiah 44, verse 28. 45, verses 1 through 4. Why, again, why is this significant? Because it speaks volumes about the nature of God and his ability to use anyone and everyone in his divine purpose. We often have a tendency to put people in boxes, labeling them as good or bad, believer or unbeliever, right or left, black or white, orange man bad. You following me? We do that. It's wrong. We don't put our faith in people that don't love God. You should never trust people who don't love God. That doesn't mean God won't use them. Doesn't mean you shouldn't look over your shoulder. Shouldn't mean you shouldn't pay attention. Shouldn't mean you shouldn't be blunt and speak the truth no matter what. Okay, but God will use people that don't fall in your ideological box. Just consider it. Some people want Jesus to be president. Jesus will never be president. Not this side of heaven. All we got to deal with is people that are fallen. Even those believers who stumble, who make mistakes, who fail. Does that make sense? By the way, Jesus isn't coming back and holding an election. He's coming back for his elect, not an election. He's coming back for his bride. And he's not coming back, you know, as the lamb who was slain. He's coming back as a conquering Jewish king. And when he comes back, regardless of what you think, what your lived experience is, or what your political values are, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him as Lord, willingly or unwillingly. Those who have accepted him willingly will enter into a new heaven and a new earth. And those who don't, and we don't talk about this enough. We don't like to talk about hell. Hell is real. It's a real place. It wasn't made for you. It was made for fallen angels. But nobody will be in hell that doesn't want to be there. Think about that for a minute. God's good. The Bible says he's willing that none should perish. He's gonna, that's what Revelation's all about. We're going to teach Revelation, I think, next year again. It's, it, it's not about all the judgment. Yes, there's judgment. Yes, there's, there's, there's things. But it's all about the fence riders. They're riding the fence. They think they can have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. You can't do that. You know what he's doing? Spitting you out of your mouth. That's what he's doing. He's saying, you got to choose and pick a side. Many of you, your life is not going the way that you want it or the, even the way that God would have it because you're trying to have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. Jesus says, woe when everyone speaks well of you. Woe, that's a bad thing. Not woke. We have this picture of what it means to follow Christ that is nowhere in the scripture. Culture has infiltrated our ideas about how to live out our faith. Nehemiah, man, this story Recenters, recenters us. It matters to us. In our lives and in our politics, we're going to have people who on the surface seem unlikely instruments of God's grace. They might not fit the mold of a typical believer, but God is not limited by our expectations or our biases. He is a God of surprises. Has anybody ever been surprised? Always working in ways that we can't predict. Our job is not to dismiss, but to have faith and expect the unexpected from who God might use. We watch what they do. Right? We fear and honor God first. Does that make sense? Let's get back to some of the background. Rebuilding the temple and the walls. This comes next. The first group of exiles returned and rebuilt the temple. This is in Ezra 3, verses 7 through 8. I'll let you read it on your own because I'm out of time. The second group, led by Ezra the scribe, focused on religious and social reforms. Nehemiah later returned with a focus on rebuilding Jerusalem's walls, fortifying the city, and providing a sense of security and community. Wow, what a picture of the church. Think about what he came back to do in rebuilding the wall and what God did when the Holy Spirit fell at the church of Acts in Acts 2. Think about that for a moment. This is a picture. Remember, the Old Testament, right, is a veiled picture of a New Testament reality. You always see that when you're reading Scripture. You might think, what does that have to do with anything? What's with all the goats and the... Well, I don't, I don't understand. Again, again, don't think, oh, those pagan heathens that didn't know anything. Okay, humble yourself and know that every single word is recorded in Scripture by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's there. Not one dot will pass away. It all has a purpose. And you'll spend the rest of your life as a believer opening up that book and seeing something you didn't see, even though you've read it a thousand times. Next, we see opposition and challenges. Wow, this is amazing. So God's called Nehemiah to do incredible things. Guess what comes right after all the blessings? I mean, it's favor with the king. They pay for it. He has protection, but then he gets there and he starts working, and guess what's the first thing that happens? opposition. Nehemiah and the returning exiles faced opposition from surrounding groups like the Samaritans. They held a grudge all the way to Jesus' day. Come on, it's true. Started right back there. They felt threatened by the Jews' return and the rebuilding efforts. We'll look more into this in week four, but you get a taste of what they experienced. We're going to talk about opposition in a couple weeks. But there were the people of 
Tekoa in Nehemiah 3.5. They wouldn't cooperate with the supervisors. Nehemiah was ridiculed. He was plotted against by Sambalot and Tobiah. But by the way, those were men who, who you, they couldn't prove they were actually Jewish. Okay, but, but they pretended to be. It's fascinating. They pretended to be. Many people thought that they were half Jewish. A trap was laid to derail his mission of rebuilding the wall. There was a plot to kill him. False prophets tried to discourage him. Opposition from the Jewish nobles. False accusation from enemies. That's just a few. And yet, despite these challenges, Nehemiah refused to get off the wall. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close, and I'm going to talk about why. He had some characteristics about him that allowed God to put a burden on his heart, right? And that challenged him to do what God said with that burden. You see, God puts burdens on our heart, not so that we can empathize. The difference between empathy and compassion is compassion meets people where they are, but doesn't leave them there. Empathy meets people where they are and just cuddles them. And ladies, listen, I know, I know, I get it. You're nurturers, you love, you cuddle. But that's one of the issues that are wrong with the world right now. We've been overmothered and underfathered. You need both, right? You need both. God, guys, come on. Would, would infant mortality would skyrocket if without, our, without our, our, our wives. Give me a break. We are not made for babies. Some of you are. You're the exception, but you'd only prove the rule. Okay, it's true. It's just true. But at some point, they're going to have to grow up, and they're going to have to learn how to be strong. And if we keep trying to protect them from everything that's going to come against them, they're going to leave, and they're going to go to these universities, or wherever. My kids will not be going there. They're going to be going to these universities where they've not been prepared to fight. There comes a time where you protect your kids from the things that will kill them. But then there comes a shift as they grow up where you have to protect them by making them so strong that no matter what comes against them, they can stand against it. Does that make sense? That's what both do. Husband and wife, they become one. That word is complement. They complement one another. One doesn't fight against the other. right? They complement each other. They're both needed. So what were the characteristics of the burden for Nehemiah? I have five characteristics in less than five minutes. You guys ready? <laughs> They're characteristics. And I want you, I'm going to challenge you. Do you have any of these? There's some burdens. There's some things we got to do as a church. There's some things you need to do in your family, in your workplace, in your life, maybe in your marriage, with your kids. And you'll never do it if you don't hold these characteristics. You got your ability to receive a burden and to move in compassion, Right? is moving compassion, is your ability to share these characteristics. I believe it. First is compassion for God's people. What do you think of when you think of God's people? Do you have compassion for people of faith? Nehemiah 1.4, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed for the God of heaven, to the God of heaven. Nehemiah had compassion on people, God's people. David had the zeal. Psalm 137, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. If I forget this, Jake, where's Jake at? May God make me forget how to play the guitar. That's essentially what he just said. Nothing else matters. Nothing I do matters if I forget God's people, God's holy city. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with the one who rejoices and weep with those who weep. Jesus had an uncharacteristic zeal for God's house. The Bible says that this, he fulfilled a prophecy that was remembered, that zeal for his house consumed him. You want to know what flipped over the money tables? It wasn't some political ideology. It was self-righteous people profiteering off of the house of God. That's what made him flip the tables. He was passionate about things. He wasn't always just petting a lamb and giving hugs. <laughs> Anyways, this is important. Do you celebrate when other believers fall short? Oh, I just knew it. I knew there was something about that guy, that girl. Do you cheer when a new podcast comes out? destroying a person in the body of Christ. Listen, you can always challenge ideas and doctrine. That's right. You go after someone personally public, the Bible says there's only one accuser of the brethren, Satan himself. You join yourself with him, you're his partner, not God's. You notice I won't do this. I won't attack a person personally. Now, if they say crazy stuff that's influencing people and ideas, I'll go after the ideas all day long. One pastor said you don't need the Old Testament to preach the gospel. What an idiot. I'm not going to say his name. He knows he's an idiot. And I've reached out personally and said, that's blasphemous. It's wrong. You're leading people astray. That's not the same as going after some struggle that he has personally and, and humiliating him in front of everybody. Even when we discipline our kids, we never humiliate them, ever. You'll never see me yank them and whoop them in front of people. I don't do that. I just don't. We have a parlor. 
that's been dubbed by my middle daughter, the parlor of despair. <laughs> May get dark, okay, but morning comes, come on. <laughs> right? You don't humiliate people, it's wrong. Especially people that you walk with, you post on Facebook about. Stop it. You want to go after an idea, go after an idea, that's fine. We need to be able to talk about ideas. We need to stop with tearing other people down. Every ac accusatory word that comes out of your mouth is not from God. It's not from God. And if he puts you in a place to be a blessing and to help, then do it quietly, just like you would a member of your own family. How would we, how would we if we treated people in the church like we treat our own family, would we say some of the things about the church? We say the church. What is the church exactly? The church hurt me. Like you bumped your head on the way in. What are you talking about? <laughs> the church is people. People hurt you. Guess what? That's a human universal. And last I checked, you've probably hurt some people too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Anyways, sorry. Next, persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. We can't stop praying. I came in here this morning. A lot of the spirit that I believe we're experiencing now, even in worship, worship was amazing, was it not? What you don't realize, we had inter intercessors praying over every single seat that you're in, believing God, not knowing who was going to sit there, but knowing that God does. Believing God in between services. Nehemiah 1.6, please listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people. If you haven't signed up for the prayer training, you should. We're going to teach you prayer. Every single believer, every member of this church should be able to pray and understand it. We need you to. You may not wake up every single day. There are people with a gift for intercession. All right, but come to that prayer meeting. We're going we're we're to train. We're going to train you on what prayer looks like and what it means. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, never stop praying. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Notice that scripture. I, I, I bounced all over the place. I apologize. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. It's the first thing we do. Instead, pray about everything. Do we do that first? Before we post, before we do anything. Every post I've ever deleted, I didn't pray first. Every time. And any post I didn't, I did pray. And I don't really care about your opinion. <laughs> it's about an idea. I want an idea out there. There can't be a vacuum of one side. There has to be ideas out there. We have to talk. Then tell God what you need, not what you want. We want a lot of things. I want what he has. Oh, God's not going to answer that. Ask God to give you what you need. And then thank him for all he's done. How do you end? With thankfulness, not despair. I, I coach our people in the prayer moment. I said, don't, don't end like a suffering Christian. You know, don't, don't end prayers. God, we just pray that you meet them there and you heal them. And you just, no, no, no. no, speak faith when, you, when you're done. God, we bring this to you. And we believe that no matter what, right here, this side of heaven or next side of heaven, you're here, you heal your people, and we're going to believe in faith for that healing. We're going to believe in faith for that person to give their life to Christ. We're going to believe in, did you get what I'm saying? Was, would it change the way you pray? I don't think God listens to empathetic prayers. Because those people want to pray as like a cathartic exercise and not actually do anything. Pray so that you hear God. Pray so that you pull God into that circumstance. Pray but know that no matter what happens, God's good. Are you breathing today? This is the day, this is the, that the Lord has made. You see, man, if we just did that every morning, if we did that before every Facebook post, guess what we realize? Are you still breathing? Are you still alive? Good, man, you're better off than all the people in the graveyard, especially those who don't know Christ. But anyways, next you have to have the courage to act. I think I've already hit this. Nehemiah, Nehemiah 2, 4 through 5, the king asked, I love this. Nehemiah prayed. God gave Nehemiah an answer. And he was ready. Because you know why? The king asked, how can I help you? Do we prepare ourselves for that promotion? Do we prepare ourselves for that breakthrough? So that when, not if it happens, we're ready to say yes? Many times we don't get what we pray for because we're not ready to receive it. We haven't heard from God. He hasn't settled our heart. Is it something we need or want? Is it before time? There's a time and a place for everything. We're in a time to build, right? Anyways, next, strategic planning and wise action. We're going to talk a lot about that in the coming weeks. Strategic planning and wise action. Compassion for God's people, persistent prayer, the courage to act, but then you have to think. A lot of people paint God as this like mystical, spooky little whatever. It wasn't. The word of God, the power of God, operates in the systems that he created. Gravity is from God. Defy it at your peril. You better be able to overcome it with lift or you're done. <laughs> There's an order to how things work. Right? You've got to work within that order. You've got to do things that are smart. I do believe this. I do believe God bring, I believe God's honor when you seek first his kingdom. Here's what, here's, what that, here's what that means for believers. 
we think it's yes or no. No, no, no. Sometimes it's just we get out over our skis. But if we do it in faith for God's people, planted in God's house, guess what? The Bible says, I, I believe God will make it up. Faith pleases God. You know, even if your timing's off, God's never is. You don't have to walk around in fear of every little decision you make. Do it in faith. Do it in faith. Step out in faith. My pastor taught me this. Be- be the Belton building. Lots of extra debt. We have a lot more now. But anyways, we bought the belt. It was a great, amazing gift. Amazing thing. I'm walking with him. I'm all scared. I'm like, I don't know about the debt, man. It's a lot. I don't know about going to the people. And I, I, don't, I don't know. And he goes, wait a minute. You mean you'd plan a church in a movie theater without a building? But in faith, God drops a building to your, in your lap and you won't just buy it? Why? And I go, I never thought about that. He goes, let me tell you something. Let's say you bought, you bought this building too soon. Did you do it to reach people in Belton? Did you do it in faith to grow God's kingdom? I said, well, yes, sir, I would. It's the only reason I did it. Then do it. That's what he told me. He said, then do it and watch God have you. Watch God have you. The courage to act, strategic planning, wise action, and finally, a sacrifice for God's house. Why do we build stuff? Because God builds stuff. The church is not a building. It's a people. It's a family. But every family needs what? Space. Every time we've added space, God's added more souls. We're going to talk more about that next week. What's that look like in the second year of the There Is More campaign? What does it look like for you to actually sacrifice something for God's house? We talk about this a lot, but there are three levels of giving. I'm going a little late, but I'm going to do it. Three levels of giving. You can give that which costs you nothing, what you can afford to give. That's the lowest level of faith. Does God meet you there? Sure. He provides seed to the sower but you're not going to be able to sow much. Then you can sacrifice. You know what that means? Stop paying Starbucks for that $17 cup of coffee. Start tightening the belt and sacrifice for God. Do something that costs you something. The greatest level of faith, though, is the level that Kyle and I have learned in the last few years. Don't put anything on God. Just simply in humility ask God, God, what do you want me to do with what you put in my hands? And then whatever he tells you, it's usually more than you can afford, and it's usually more than you can sacrifice. It's just been my experience. And you know what God says? It's in that place of faith that God blesses you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And as you're built up in God's house, you'll have everything that you need. Nehemiah 5.10, I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain, but now let us stop this business of charging interest. Something dawned as they were in this work that there was nothing more important than seeing it through. Galatians 6, 2, share each other's burdens and in this way, and in this way obey the law of Christ. I believe these characteristics are key. I want to put them back on the screen one more time. Put them back on the screen. I'm going to pray. All five. Compassion for God's people. Persistent prayer. Ultimately, we have to act, but not foolishly. We have to consider the cost and then we have to sacrifice for what's most important. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for the power of your word. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our church. I pray, God, that you would continue to encourage us, build us. We thank you, God, that as we partner with you in building your house, Father, our house is built up in it. We thank you, Father, for the story of Nehemiah. The remnant left. You gave him a burden that he didn't just sit on because you knew that Nehemiah was a man of action and principle. You knew that Nehemiah knew your word and loved you and would do everything you asked him to do. That's why you gave him the assignment, Lord, and that's why you give us assignments. We prove that we love you by doing what you say. We love you and we thank you, God. May you speak to us as we round out this year. Father, I also pray for anybody in here that doesn't know you. I pray, God, that they would not leave this place the same way that they came in. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around, we're almost done. It's perhaps one of the most important parts of our entire service. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know God. Maybe it's because of pride. The truth is, you've always looked down on Christians, on the Bible, on God in general. Maybe you have an experience that led you that direction. But as a result of hearing God's word, there's something inside of you pulling you towards it. That's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's still your choice. God never makes you do anything. You have to choose. You have to choose him. Maybe you're in here and you followed God at some point in your life, but you're not following him today. You've gotten off the path. You need to get back on the path. Good thing about ditches, you find yourself in one, you can get back to the road. Get back to the road. Get back to God ordering your steps. Regardless of where you find yourself today, you were created by God and you will never be all that God's called you to be apart from relationship to him and you cannot get there apart from Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. His death for every single one of your shortcomings, for your evil sins and deeds. Every single one, past, present, and future, was nailed to that cross. But Jesus didn't stay in that grave. The Bible says he resurrected. 
every, every death as a believer results in a resurrection. God finds you where you are, but he doesn't leave you there. Believing that Christ died for your sins on the cross, accepting that he rose from the dead, that's the beginning, not the end of walking with God. And as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, in a moment I'm gonna pray for you. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna single you out. We're not doing that. Maybe you're in here today and you're just far from God. You don't wanna be. And you'd want my prayer. If that's you, as heads are bowed, would you just acknowledge that? Lift up your hand. Let me see you. I see you. I see you. Just lift up it and I see you all over the room. I see you. It's the most important decision you can make, but it's yours. I see you. I see you. In a moment, I'm gonna lead you in, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer to God for the first time or back to God for the hundredth time. I want to encourage you to say this prayer just loud enough where you can hear your own voice. The people around you, believers who love God and love you, are going to pray so as to encourage your faith as well. I believe God's going to move through this prayer. I believe, because it's rooted in Scripture and the power of God, I believe he's going to meet you there, but he's not going to leave you there. We're also going to give you some steps to help you grow and find your place in the body of Christ so that you can mature and develop. But right now, let's get right with God. Church, we believe in what they're doing. Let's pray this prayer all together. Let's pray, Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you are good, and I believe you're God. I believe on the third day, after you were killed on the cross, I believe you resurrected from the dead. I believe you defeated death once and for all to give me life once and for all. Not just eternal life, but the best life now. And so of my own free will, I choose to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Lead me and guide me. Show me what's next. It's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together for everybody who did that. Church, you give. just go ahead. Put your hands together for Pastor Stephen for that amazing message. Thank him for that.